Hey everyone, welcome back. Let's uh, let's dive right in. You ready to rethink the whole employee experience thing? Always up for a good rethink. Hit me with it. Okay, so we're looking at this book, right, by this, well, longtime HR pro. And get this, they love Andy Haight working at their company. Ooh, juicy contradiction right off the bat. I like where this is going. Right. And that's just the preface. We're really digging into uh, chapter one today. And let me tell you, this author does not hold back. They think the corporate world, especially HR, stuck in the dark ages. Like seriously, when it comes to this whole employee experience thing. Yeah, they don't mince words, that's for sure. The authors out there saying most companies are like clinging to these outdated practices that just don't work. You know what I'm talking about, like pizza parties, employee of the month, mm. all that surface level stuff. So we're talking putting a Band-Aid on a broken bone here. Exactly. They're saying these efforts totally miss the mark, right? Because they don't address the root causes of why employees are unhappy. It's all appearances, not genuine well-being. Like, they're really critical of companies that pour tons of money into employer branding, how they look to potential hires. But then what about the people who already work there? Right. It's like putting all your effort into staging this beautiful house for sale. Right. But behind the scenes, the plumbing is shot. The foundation's crumbling. Perfect analogy. And this leads to like one of the most fascinating things in the book, this concept of desired lines. Desired lines, huh? Okay, now you've got my attention. So imagine a park, right? Perfectly manicured lawns, these paved paths, the whole nine yards. But people keep cutting across the grass, making their own shortcuts. Those shortcuts, those are the desired lines. Okay, I'm with you. Keep going. It's about seeing how people naturally behave, you know? Not how we want them to behave, but how they actually do. And what those behaviors tell us about those uh, flaws in our carefully designed processes. Oh, this book blew my mind when I read this part. So, like, in the workplace, those desired lines could be, I don't know, how employees find workarounds for a clunky software system or how they choose to communicate, even if it goes against the company's like official channels. Exactly. And instead of forcing people back onto those rigid paths, they're saying companies should be paying attention to those desired lines. They're a gold mine of information. Right. So instead of getting annoyed that people are taking shortcuts, see it as valuable feedback. Right. Exactly. It's about figuring out, okay, what's working, what's not working, and how can we design a workplace that actually aligns with how people want to work? Now you're speaking my language. And this leads us to one of the author's bolder claims, which is they think HR, in its current state, needs a complete and utter revolution. Whoa, a revolution, huh? That's a strong word. Even for this author, mm -hmm. what are they proposing? Give you the juicy details. Well, they're arguing that so many HR departments, they get so bogged down in managing processes, think outdated KPIs, ineffective performance reviews, all that stuff, that they forget to actually, you know, prioritize people. So it's like following a recipe to the letter, but you don't understand the principles of cooking. Right. You can follow every instruction, but without that deeper understanding, you're not going to be a great chef. Exactly. They're saying many HR departments lack the creativity, the adaptability to actually connect with employees, create a good culture. Okay, so if traditional HR isn't the answer, what is? What does this author propose? Buckle up, because they suggest something pretty radical. Move the responsibility for employee experience away from HR. Completely. Put it on the shoulders of direct managers and leaders. Wow, really? So putting the power back into the hands of the people who are, you know, actually interacting with their teams every day. Now, that's interesting. Why do they think that's better? Because they're saying those direct managers, they're the ones who are best positioned to understand their team's needs, recognize their strengths, and actually cultivate an environment where those people can thrive. Okay, I see where they're going with mm -hmm. this. But if HR isn't managing the employee experience, what are they doing? Like sitting around brainstorming new company slogans? Not quite. They see HR as this strategic partner, you know, yeah. providing the framework, the resources, the guidance to empower those managers and leaders to succeed. So less like policy police, more like supportive coach. Okay, so less about dictating from on high, more about giving the folks on the front lines the tools they need to, you know, actually create good experiences for their teams. I like that. Right, and that leads us to another fascinating concept the author talks about, which is microcultures. Microcultures. This author sure likes their buzzwords. Okay, I'm intrigued. Lay it on me. So they're challenging this idea that any company has just one big monolithic culture, right? 
They're saying within any given company, you've got all these smaller, distinct cultures happening at the team level, hence microcultures. Okay, that makes sense. Each team has their own dynamic, their own way of doing things. Like the sales team's going to have a very different energy from the engineering team. Exactly. And here's where it gets really interesting. The author argues that these microcultures are super shaped by the behaviors that are tolerated, even rewarded regardless of what the company officially says it values. So, for example, a company might say they value work-life balance. But then, if a manager is always sending emails at 4.0 a.m. and it's tolerated, even, you know, subtly rewarded, that sends a very different message. Exactly. It creates this disconnect between what the company says it stands for and what it actually feels like to work there. Right. And those microcultures, they probably have a much bigger impact on employee experience than any company-wide initiative. 100%. You could have the most amazing company culture on paper, free snacks, snap pods, the whole shebang. But if you're stuck on a team with a toxic boss or a negative environment, that's going to overshadow everything. That tracks. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. So then they get into how this applies to HR, especially things like, you know, employee well-being initiatives, right? Yes. And prepare to be slightly outraged because they really go after things like employee awards. They even say that a lot of those traditional well-being initiatives are a complete waste of money. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on. Are they saying we get rid of all the free yoga classes and meditation app subscriptions? Not necessarily. Their point is these things, right, while well-intentioned, they don't address the root causes. It's like, you know, putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. It might make you feel better for a second, but it's not fixing the actual problem. Okay, so what they're saying is that before you invest in a meditation app for your employees, maybe you should first look at the company policies that are causing them to be stressed out in the first place. Now you're getting it. It's about addressing those systemic issues, those those really deeply ingrained practices that are creating a negative experience for employees. Those things, no amount of yoga or meditation can fix. Right, right. It's not enough to just slap on a feel-good initiative and call it a day. But if those quick fixes aren't the answer, what is? Yeah. How do we actually create a positive and engaging culture for employees? That's where things get really interesting. The author's position is that true company culture isn't about posters on the wall or those like mandatory fun events that everyone secretly dreads. Oh, tell me about it. The dreaded team building activity. Right. They argue it's really about the behaviors that are consistently tolerated and rewarded. Sometimes it's about what's punished or pushed aside. That's what actually shapes the culture. So it's about walking the walk, not just talking the talk. Exactly. You want to create a culture of respect. You can't yeah. just have a poster that says, we value respect. You actually have to address disrespectful behavior when you see it and reward the people who are demonstrating those values and their actions day after day. That's how you build something real, not just aspirational. Exactly. Because actions, they speak louder than words. Yeah. Right. And if there's a mismatch between what a company says it values and how it actually operates, Employees are going to see right through that. Yeah. No amount of clever marketing can hide a toxic culture once word gets out. <laughs> and that's online reviews, right? Water cooler talk, the whole nine yards. Precisely. Which, you know, kind of brings us to the author's critique of this whole HR is people and culture trend, mm -hmm. which feels like is everywhere these days. Right, right. They really go after that one. They do. And their argument is basically, in most companies, HR just doesn't have the power to actually shape the culture. Mm -hmm. They even call it a, quote, cruel trick played on HR departments. Because, like we were saying, that power really sits with the managers, the leaders, the ones setting the tone every single day. Exactly. How can a department, any department, be responsible for something they have zero control over? It's impossible. The author even argues that often, HR is forced to put policies in place that go directly against the company's stated culture. Okay, now I need an example. Give me one of their examples of this in action. Sure. They talk about this company that's all over social media, right? Their website, too, talking about diversity, inclusion, all that. But then their job application. They ask candidates for their age, marital status, even if they're pregnant. It's right there on the form. Ouch. Yeah, you can't talk the talk if you're not walking the walk. Exactly. So their point is, instead of saddling HR with this vague, kind of meaningless title of people and culture, we need to be honest about their role and what it isn't. And if we actually want to improve company culture, we got to empower the people who have the ability to change it, the managers, the leaders, day in and day out. Right. So a whole mindset shift, power dynamics, too, and a lot more honesty. Got it. 
But they don't just stop at critiquing HR, do they? Oh, no, not even close. They also get into some fascinating stuff, kind of heartbreaking, too, about whistleblowers. Oh, right. They talk about how companies treat whistleblowers. It really reveals a lot about their culture yeah. and about HR's actual power or lack thereof within that culture. Exactly. They even compare whistleblowers to, like, the canary in the coal mine, you mm. know? They're often the first ones to see that toxic behavior, that unethical stuff, and they speak up, even though it might cost them their job. And the way a company responds to those people, that says everything about their values. Yes. And they share this example. There's this whistleblower, did everything by the book, reported misconduct, had proof, everything, and it all went directly against the company's code of conduct. You know what happened. They got fired. Wow. That is just disheartening. Right. And the author says this is more common than we'd like to think. They argue HR is either too scared to stand up to the higher ups, to actually advocate for what's right, or, and this is worse, they help cover up the misconduct. So it becomes this question of power, right? Ethics, and whether HR even has the tools to do their job, to actually protect the employees in the company. Yeah, it's a tough spot to be in for sure. And it's bigger than just one person. The author actually calls on companies to do more to protect people in HR, especially when they're trying to make those tough ethical calls. Because if the people whose job it is to care about ethics, if they're being silenced, punished for doing that job, yeah, then who's left to actually uphold those values? Exactly. It sets this chilling effect through the whole company. Right. It sends a message. Don't speak up. Even if you see something wrong, hmm. just stay quiet. A hundred percent. And speaking of often misunderstood HR practices, let's talk about performance reviews because this author is right. not a fan. Oh, yeah. They do not hold back on that one. And honestly, who loves those annual sit downs where your whole year is judged on like a handful of bullet points? Mm -hmm. Did you reply all to that email from like six months ago? Right. It can feel so random, so subjective. And their point is that often those reviews create more stress than they're worth. And they don't even reflect how much someone's actually contributed or their potential. OK, so if not the dreaded annual review, then what? How should we be giving feedback, evaluating people? They actually want to, like, totally overhaul the whole system. Instead of those formal once a year things, they want regular casual check ins focused on development. You know, how can this person grow? Not just judgment. So less. Here's what you did wrong. More. How can we help you improve? Exactly. More coaching, less judging. They also say we should ditch those rigid metrics, the KPIs that sometimes cause more problems than they solve. Ooh, can you give an example of a KPI that might be doing more harm than good? Sure. Think about attrition rate. So many companies, they just want to keep that number as low as possible, but they don't always think about the value those employees bring, even if they're not there for decades. That's such a good point. It's like only focusing on how many people come and go from a party and not whether anyone's actually having fun, right? Exactly. It's about the bigger picture, uh, understanding the impact employees have and realizing that sometimes someone leaving isn't a failure. Maybe they outgrew the role, found something new that fits their goals better, and that's okay. It's like careers and lives in general, they're not linear anymore. People change jobs, explore, prioritize different things at different times. Right. And this leads into another critique they have about traditional HR, which is that often they focus on measuring things that can't actually be measured, like engagement or happiness. Which is funny because I just saw this job posting chief happiness officer mm. at a tech company. Can you believe that? Yeah. But yeah, you can't just like quantify love or creativity, those things matter, but they're not about numbers. Exactly. The author says this whole obsession with data, it's created all these KPIs that tell us nothing about the actual employee experience. It's like trying to measure the success of a painting by, I don't know, analyzing the chemicals in the paint. Right. Again, it goes back to focusing on the wrong things, getting lost in the numbers instead of seeing the human beings. But if we're not measuring things like engagement, happiness, then how do we even know it's working? They suggest that instead of trying to put numbers on those subjective experiences, HR should gather different data. Listen to what employees are actually saying. Get the nuances of their experiences. They talk about open-ended questions, one-on-one -on -one conversations, and figuring out the why, not just the what. So more conversations, less spreadsheets. I can get on board with that. Now, there's this other part I wanted to ask about, where they talk about how companies often mistake perks, you know, initiatives for an actual culture. Yes. They're especially critical of those lavish culture building events, team building, free food, ping pong tables, all that stuff companies spend a fortune on, hoping to create a fun and engaging workplace. But as this author so brilliantly points out, 
none of that matters if underneath it all the culture's toxic hmm. where you've got bad managers or employees feel like cogs in a machine it's like putting lipstick on a pig you know right i love that it's exactly their point they even call those forced fun things corporate prescribed mandatory fun or voluntold like you're told you have to go even if you'd rather just I don't know, do your actual work. Oh, I've been there. The awkward trust falls, the forced socializing. It's like you have to pretend to be having fun, but you'd rather be anywhere else. Exactly. And they're saying these things often backfire. They feel fake. They don't address the real issues impacting morale. People might even resent it if they feel like it's a waste of their time. It's just another Band-Aid, right? Yeah. Covering up the cracks instead of fixing the foundation. Precisely. And it gets worse. They even say this obsession with culture has led to some seriously bizarre, kind of creepy stuff, like companies paying people to get tattoos of their company value. Wait, really? Tattoos. Okay, now that's commitment. I don't know if I want to work for a company that wants their logo permanently inked on my body. Right. It's this idea that if we just force the culture hard enough, if it's loud and in your face enough, then it'll become real. But it doesn't work that way. You can't force people to embody your values, especially not with a tattoo gun. You can't mandate culture. It has to come from the people within the organization. It has to be genuine. Exactly. So they're encouraging companies to focus less on those superficial things the ping pong the beer fridays whatever focus more on actually creating an environment where those values are reflected in how people treat each other every day okay so it's about authenticity alignment making a workplace where people feel valued respected not just entertained but it's not all doom and gloom right they give solutions too, right? Yeah. For companies that want to make things better for their employees. Absolutely. And one of their big points is that improving employee experience doesn't have to be some huge expensive thing. They talk about these really simple but impactful changes. They call them uh, micro adjustments. And the idea is if you do these consistently, it creates this ripple effect throughout the company. Okay. I like that. Baby steps, but in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So what are some of these micro adjustments? What can people listening start doing today? They have a bunch, but they focus on three. First, pay attention to those desired lines we talked about earlier. Right. Those workarounds people create because the official way is just too clunky or outdated or makes no sense. But we have to see those as data, not defiance, right? Exactly. Ask yourself, what are these telling us about what's wrong with how we're doing things? And how can we use that info to design things better to work the way people actually work? Okay, so step one. Find those desired lines, then what? Step two is all about challenging the status quo. They're telling us to look around, find those policies, procedures, whatever, that are outdated, ineffective, or just go against what employees care about. It's like asking, why are we still doing it this way? Is it the best way or just how we've always done it? Yes. And then be willing to let go of those practices that aren't working, even if it's uncomfortable. Because holding on to the past, just because it's familiar, that's how things stagnate. That takes guts, though, right? Easier said than done. Oh, for sure. Change is hard. But the author reminds us it's necessary for growth, for individuals and for organizations. And they give this whole framework for having those tough conversations, for pushing back against resistance. So don't just barge in and demand everything change. Be strategic. Make your case. Get people on board. Exactly. And be persistent. Be patient. Real change takes time. Okay, so we've got our desired lines. We're challenging the status quo. What's that third micro adjustment we can make? This one's huge and probably the hardest. We got to examine the behaviors that are tolerated, even rewarded within our teams. Oof, yeah. That's about accountability mm -hmm. for ourselves and each other. Looking around and saying, does how we're acting, how we treat each other, how we celebrate wins, even how we handle failures, does it all line up with the culture we say we want? And if not, what are we going to do about it? Yes, because culture isn't some words on a wall. It's not a slogan. It's what we do every day. Such an important reminder. It's not enough to talk about it. We got to live it. Actions, not just words. Right. And that means being self-aware, holding ourselves accountable, which can be tough, especially at work. But it's how we build those healthy cultures where everyone feels valued, respected. That's how you get people doing their best work. I love that. Now, one more thing I wanted to circle back to. We talked about those well-being initiatives earlier, and I know the author is, well, skeptical. Didn't they cite some research on that? They did. They mentioned a study from Oxford, and the researchers found that those individual things like mindfulness or whatever, they're nice, but they don't really change much long term when it comes to employee well-being. Like those fad diets. Mm. 
might work for a minute, but it's not a real solution. You can't just like meditate your way out of a toxic workplace. Exactly. And that study found that what actually makes a bigger difference is organizational change. Clear expectations for roles, good relationships between colleagues, flexible work, job security, enough staff, all that stuff. So it's about fixing the root of the problem, the stuff that causes the stress, the burnout in the first place. Build a better environment and the well-being follows. Exactly. And the author says, stop wasting money on those surface level things. Put that money towards actually making the workplace better. Actions speak louder. Right. right. It's about those foundational elements. Yeah. Build a healthy environment first. Solid foundation, not just a fresh coat of paint to hide the cracks. Love that. This author, they really connect the dots. They do. And they're not afraid to challenge the way we think about work, which I respect. Now, before we wrap up this part, one more brilliant point I wanted to touch on. They have this metaphor, the symphony orchestra, to explain their point about the importance of employee experience. Oh, yeah. That's one of my favorite parts, too. So they're saying businesses usually focus on two things, right? Profit and making the customers happy. Those are the instruments that are always playing loud and clear because without them, the business is sunk. Right. No profit, unhappy customers, game over. Exactly. But then there's this third instrument, employee experience, and it's often ignored or out of tune. Because companies don't get that. Like we've been saying, employee experience is connected to those other two. It's all one big system. Exactly. And the author says, if we want the whole symphony to sound amazing, to have this harmonious, successful organization, we need all three instruments in tune. It's about finding that balance where the needs of the business, the customers, and the employees, they all work together. Yes. When those three are in harmony, that's when the magic happens. This is a lot. So many ideas packed into this book, and we're only on the first chapter. <laughs> you know, right? It's a lot <laughs> to take in. But that's why I love these deep dives. We really get to, like, sink our teeth and, you know, explore these topics from every angle. It's so important to challenge how we think things are supposed to be, especially at work, where so much is, well, stuck in the past. Absolutely. And this book doesn't just complain. It gives solutions. Speaking of, we still have more to cover from chapter one, right? We do. And the author makes this great point. Making things better for employees, it doesn't have to be this huge, company-wide, overwhelming thing. Okay, good, because that feels impossible sometimes. Right. They say it can start small, little changes. They call them micro-adjustments. But if you do them consistently, it snowballs, creates this ripple effect. Baby steps, but in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I like it. So what are some of these micro adjustments we can all start doing like today? Well, they've got a whole bunch, but they really emphasize three. Number one, pay attention to those desired lines we talked about. Right. Those workarounds people are already using because the official way is clunky or makes no sense. We got to see that as data, right? Not some attack on the system. Exactly. Ask yourself, what are people trying to tell us by doing it this other way? What's broken that we're not seeing? And how can we make things better so it works the way people actually work? Step one, find the workarounds, the desired lines. What's next? Step two, and this is big. We got to challenge the way things are. Look around your workplace, find the policies, the procedures, whatever, that are just outdated. Or they clash with what employees actually care about. So asking that question, why are we still doing it this way? Just because we always have. Yep. And then here's the hard part. Be ready to let go of what's not serving you anymore, even if it feels weird to change. Because holding on too tight to how things used to be, that's a recipe for getting stuck. That takes some serious guts, though, to challenge the status quo. Oh, totally. Change is tough, but this author, they'd say it's like, hmm, necessary for growth. As a person, as a company, you got to evolve. And they even give advice on how to have those tough conversations, how to get people on board with new ideas. So it's not about running in and demanding everything to be different tomorrow. It's about having a plan and getting people to buy into that plan. Right. And it takes time. Be persistent. Be patient. Real change doesn't happen overnight. OK, so we've found the desired lines. We're challenging the way things are done. What's that third micro adjustment? This one's big, maybe the biggest and the hardest. We got to be honest about the behaviors that are accepted, even rewarded on our teams. Woof. Accountability time for ourselves and each other. Looking around and saying, is this how we want to be? Is this who we are? How we treat each other? How we handle things when they go right and when they go wrong? If not, time to do something different. 100%. Culture, it's not a poster on the wall, it's not some slogan, it's what we live every day, 
in how we act. Such a good point. It's not enough to just talk about it. We got to walk the walk. Right. And that takes being real with ourselves, being accountable, which, let's be honest, not always fun, especially at work. Yeah. But if we want healthy teams where people feel valued, respected, that's the work we got to do. Could not agree more. This has been so eye-opening. I feel like I have a whole new way of thinking about this stuff. Me too. I always learn something new from this author. They really make you think. They do. And for our listeners, we hope this has sparked some new ideas for you too. This deep dive into employee experience, it's been a wild ride. Thanks for coming along. We'll catch you next time for another deep dive into a topic that matters.